Welcome back to the 21st Century Physio Podcast. We're back with episode 24. And today, we've got a man who probably doesn't need much introduction, and I probably haven't got enough time to give him the introduction he deserves. But let me go ahead and give you a little bit about his background. So this man is a chiropractor. He's the director and creator and founder of LA Sports and Spine. He's a researcher. He's an educator with his business, First Principles of Movement, as well as an author and publisher of two textbooks, including the Functional Training Handbook and the Rehabilitation of the Spine, uh, the two textbooks that I most recently purchased. Uh, so a big influence on my career as well. Obviously, talking about Dr. Craig Williamson. Welcome, Craig. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to to hear a good Australian accent. <laughs> and for Very us thick Australian this, accent. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, it's been probably, I want to say, 15 years since I was in Australia. And uh, I, it's a pleasure to be invited by you to just chat for, for an hour. Well, we'll definitely um, touch on your sort of time in Australia, uh, over in Western Australia with some of the work you've done there. But tell me first, why chiropractic? What sort of drew you to that profession initially going back all those years? Great question. So uh, I was a vegetarian when I was uh, about 15, and people asked me a lot of questions about my diet. My uh, parents had a lot of friends that were very conservative and in medicine, and I grew up outside of New York City, so not quite the California kind of holistic lifestyle, uh, granola and all that stuff. So um, I was questioned about the health merits, and I became a vegetarian because I uh, wanted to live more of a non-violent lifestyle and i was uh, being introduced to mindfulness or meditation and um, didn't really think about the health aspects of it but i was questioned so you know even though i was eating peanut butter and jelly and pizza at the time uh i started to wonder and um as i started to look at it i realized well you know what there's a lot of heart disease in 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 our society uh, people are not that healthy and medicine has lots of side effects. And I was always kind of rebellious. So um, when I went to university, so at 18, age 18, I studied philosophy and I specialized in philosophy of science. And um, I was pre-med and that led me to realizing that as far as epistemology, um, that modern medicine is not really living up to like the Hippocratic Oath. And even though I was never uh, a believer in chiropractic, in spite of going three times for some, some back pain that I had as a tennis player, uh, I chose when I finished, I finished my philosophy degree uh, to, to pursue chiropractic. I already had the prerequisites out of the way being pre-med. And it wasn't because of a belief in chiropractic, um, but I thought that would be an ideal vantage point, like as an osteopath or a physical therapist, uh, to promote activity and a uh, lifestyle approach to you know leading a healthier life. Fantastic. I think that's as uh, good a reason as any. So when you, you went through your chiropractic studies, you've come out, what was the next step for you sort of taking that jump into practice in those first few years? Yeah, well, you know, for me, it was interesting going to chiropractic school and not being a believer in chiropractic. So at that time, you know, we're talking in the um, early mid 1980s, there was studies coming out on the value of manipulative therapy. And there was a, con a conference in the late 70s uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, convening a panel of scientists and experts uh, from all over the world uh, about the 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 value of manipulative therapy. And, and the verdict was that this had been uh, shunned uh, inappropriately. And at the, and this then uh, rolled into the evidence-based healthcare movement, which started in Canada from Sackett, but led to different guidelines for low back pain, all of which positioned manipulative therapy on par or above like Tylenol and spoke to, there was too much imaging. You had a lot of CAT scans. This is before MRIs, too much advanced imaging, too much diagnosis of structural pathology and more of a biopsychosocial model was emerging. Uh, Gordon Waddell had written a Volvo award-winning paper in spine on the biopsychosocial model, applying angles thinking uh, to musculoskeletal problems, spine pain in particular. So all this was going on in the background when I was a student. So really before I left school, so you're asking about when I left school, while I was in school, I was questioning everything. I was learning about muscles and soft tissues. My favorite topic was really osteopathy. 
I was studying from the osteopaths, from Philip Greenman, from the great scientist Irvin Kaur, learning about fascia and um, uh, learning about more gentle techniques, if you will. So uh, by the time I finished, I had already been exposed to my mentors, Dr. Carol Levitt and Professor Vladimir Yanda, neurologists from Prague, who were heavily influenced by osteopaths um, and rehabilitation. Points, how faulty movement patterns of the locomotor system that with minimally invasive strategies that don't create dependency, we can empower people. So it was all about rehab. It was all about active care. It was all about what we now call self-management. Uh, and, and you almost could put a fork in me uh, by the time I was one or two years out of school. What, what I've learned to your question about since then is that it's not so much about faulty movement patterns like the Prague School taught, uh, that there is so much variability and people have so many ways to hit a golf ball, to throw a dart, uh, to bend and lift. Um, and so some of our ideas about correct and incorrect uh, were incorrect. <laughs> and, and it's really about giving people more like Peter O'Sullivan teaches, uh, self-efficacy and competence. Um, and identifying whether they lack confidence. Uh, and so we want to create an environment, and this is sort of the signature of my courses, that give people positive experience with movement uh, and then uh, challenge them through graded exposures so that there is some adaptation. So we find the hardest thing a person does well that's linked to both their demands, their goals, and whatever we find when we're doing like a functional dashboard or, or something that's dear to you, uh, measuring their 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 baselines. It definitely very close to my heart. So going back to, I guess, the skills you learned through university and you talked about the value of manipulative therapy, like where does that fit into your framework now and into your practice day to day? It's elective. Uh, I always want to find out what people expect. Uh, of course, who doesn't want a quick fix, right? So uh, everybody wants, you know, elbow in their QL, a stretch for their psoas. Um, uh, you know, some people want a cavitation. Some people just want mob mobilizations. Uh, but everybody wants a fix-it approach. Everybody wants to think it's linear and it's simple, but it's never simple. And so we um, steer people after we validated their experience, their lived experience, after we know how they embody these different beliefs about uh, a biomedical way of thinking, a biomechanical way of thinking, um, we start to steer them towards um, uh, the importance of their lifestyle and behavior. And, and we do so by opening them up to the fact that there isn't like one holy grail, one cause. It's not your SI, it's not your QL, it's not your SOAS, it's not your arthritis, your bulging disc, torn labrum. It, it's, it's all of those things. Plus, it's your sleep hygiene. It's your uh, diet. Are you eating a clean diet? Uh, what's your stress level like? Uh, all these things are part of, 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 of the person. And they're all important. And I want to empower people by showing them how we can get the most from the least. And, and that's, that's the gold standard for me. It's not me fixing them. It's me showing them how they can get the most from the least. So it may be that um, we find they have a flexion intolerance or they have a pain in the hip in a 90-90 in a shin box. Um, and then we go and do some banded split stance, kick stance. And they go, my gosh, holy cow, I felt my glutes. I didn't feel my hip. I didn't feel my back. Uh, I'm able to do the shin box. I'm able to do the forward bend. Uh, wow, should I do that at home? So my goal is to stage things, like Brett Bartholomew says, from onset to encore, so that they, they, without me soliciting it, they volunteer. Wow, should I do that? So it's a collaboration. I'm pulling strings, I'm orchestrating through gamification, through constraints-based motor learning, a, an exploration that gives them confidence, that leads them to ask for permission. Should I do that? So I never tell people what they should do. Like, there's no should and ought. Uh, it's create an environment where they have a positive experience with movement, where you're violating their expectations, they're having an aha. I want them to have an aha. 
And so what are some of those strategies you use if someone does come in with the expectation, uh, you know, that they have previous experiences with, you know, chiropractors, for instance? What, what are some of your strategies, I guess, for that person to change their expectation? And uh, how do you go about setting up that success with that movement approach? And obviously, this is part of your whole course, uh, which we'll talk about later. But what, what are some go-to well, strategies? It's all part of change? my philosophy. Yeah it's, yeah, it's all the same. It's all it all blends. Cause, you know, I practice five days a week. I, I sometimes practice more because I do telehealth on weekends. Um, I write every day. I research every day. I'm I'm researching literature and and conference proceedings on Twitter. No place better uh, in the world. Uh, I get to listen to uh, what Emmanuel Stomaticus, one of the physical activity uh, experts in the world, who's in Sydney, has to say, or what Peter O'Sullivan. Uh, is saying um, what experts in Europe or North America are saying, whether they're from Calgary or, or I don't care where. Um, and I get to kind of keep growing and, and thinking and challenging myself. And then when I have an aha, I get to share that with my patients, with uh, people studying from me, uh, et cetera. So uh, it's, it, it's a very uh, organic process, if you will. And I think, um, I think the most important thing is the humility that I learned from Dr. Levitt, uh, to keep an open mind for new ideas that sometimes shows what we thought or believed before was wrong. So I'm constantly um, open to, to surprising myself. Like in my career, I used to think that it was about motor control and that if somebody's doing something wrong, we should teach them how to do it right. Uh, and we should cue people and position them with our hands, manual positioning like they teach in PNF. And now I realize it's better to use the environment. And uh, when they come in and they expect one thing, the most important thing I can do is create the environment to answer your question. Sorry about that digression. Uh, uh, where they're comfortable and I validate them. So Peter O'Sullivan talks about this as well as anybody. Uh, have a passionate curiosity to hear each person's story because, because they're, uh, a person's biography becomes their biology and their behavior is influenced by their beliefs. So I want to hear them. I want to receive their story. I don't take a history. They'll, our language is so is such a minefield. What is this taking histories? We receive a history and, and letting people tell their story. I let people tell their story for 45 minutes. And then we do what Peter teaches as far as a behavioral experimentation. We, uh, we dive into movement together and I don't tell them I'm exercising them. I, I say, let's see how you move <laughs> and it's safe. And then I tell them, let me know if it hurts, you know, and then later we can talk about does hurt equal harm, you know, you know, first just tell me if it hurts. And if it hurts, it's like, uh, is it tolerable? And they'll go, yeah. And I go, yeah. Cause not every hurt equals harm. They go, yeah. So like we're set planting seeds. Um, and then by the end, we found things that hurt. We found things that relate to their goals, like they want to run, they have knee pain. And, you know, we found the single leg activity that they're not as good on the painful side with. And, you know, we establish a goal like running is a single leg sport. We want to build up that capacity. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we reverse engineer to things that matter to them. So we, we listen to what they want. They want an adjustment. But it's bigger than that. We listen to what they think is wrong. Uh, I think I'm out of alignment. We listen to what their goals are. Well, I want to be able to run. We listen uh, to what they think uh, 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 triggered it. Well, I don't know. I've been running all my life, so I, I'm confused. And then we gives us windows open. And, and the windows that are going to open are when we've done the shin box, Oh, my, my hip, hip is really stiff on that side. Could that be related to my knee? Uh, or my balance is off on that leg. Or my balance reach is off on that leg. Or my, 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 my glute doesn't, I don't feel my glute on this side. I feel it on the other side. Uh, it becomes very plausible to the individual, to the patient, that any one of those things uh, that are lighting up on the dashboard uh, could be related to their complaint. We're creating meaning. So we're determining what matters by listening to them. And included in that is their expectations and their beliefs. Uh, and then we're measuring what matters. And this is setting the stage for the opening of the curtain to creating a plan to change what matters. And that's where our highest value is because what we want 
is to find what can get the most from the least because people want the the easy way that's human nature so when we find what's changeable like hey there's plasticity and you know you have neuroplasticity and you can learn new things and 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 it's a lot easier to change your shin box and your glute pattern than it is to change your x-ray and adjustment is great it might open a window but i want to show you what to do for yourself because it's not going to last and they go yeah yeah now they they want an adjustment or they wanted soft tissue but they know those things don't last so we're starting to just sort of cascade stuff and when you're setting up that framework, I guess, in your clinical environment, you sort of mentioned you take a history for, you know, 45 minutes plus. How do you structure your consults around that and um, sort of the, the management plan, I guess, with the um, person that you're working with? Well, the first thing is uh, they've scheduled for an hour and a half. So they know it's, it's not what they're expecting, a 45-minute, 30-minute hour thing. It's, for, it's an hour and a half. Um, they fill out brief paperwork so we don't inundate them with, with miserable questions, but the paperwork is steers them to like, what are you hoping to get out of this visit? What are your goals? We ask confidence questions. Uh, how confident are you? You're moving in the right direction. These are yellow flags questions. Uh, do you believe that hurt equals harm? Do you believe activity is harmful? Do you think you'll be better in six months? These are abridged versions of very famous adjudicated yellow flags questions we ask about wellness which every professional sport team asks about about mood about soreness about sleep about stress so i don't have to ask those ticklish questions about stress and then they think i'm suggesting the pain is in their head they've already written that they're irritable moody under a lot of stress and not sleeping so i get to go back to what they wrote uh, we ask them about their physical activity we use tim gabbett's approach and ask you know, about three sample activities that they participate in. And we, we, we describe the RP, ask them to rank the RP. How many times a week do you do this? Uh, uh, how many minutes per, 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 per training or exercise? So maybe it's just walking is, is the most strenuous thing they do. Maybe it's hiking. Maybe it's a weightlifting session of the RPE of five out of 10. Um, so we've already staged that. I look at it before I see them. So the hour and a half is their time with me. I'm spending more time. I'm looking at the forms. I'm summarizing the forms. So I have a jumping off point. Um, uh, and, and then we go from there. And then as far as the environment, after the 45 minutes, it's it's a welcome mat to, okay, let's see how you move. And we leave the, the confines of the room where there's a table to an open gym area. So, you know, we call it the tyranny of the visit or the tyranny of the cl clinic. In a clinical setting, people are expecting a quick fix because the rituals all take place in a room with a table and stuff. And there's boxes with wires and all that stuff. But we migrate out to the gym floor uh, for the final half of session one. And on subsequent sessions, they may never see the so-called treatment room again. Sounds like a very nice uh, philosophy there. And so I guess um, when you're sort of empowering your clients, what are, what are some of the strategies, I guess, that you're first go to? Are you looking at um, like more integrating into the specific movements that the individual's having trouble with? Are you looking at specific sort of stretches? Are you looking through some self um, sort of release? And obviously it's going to vary patient to patient, but do you have a bit of a framework um, that you work with off the back of that dashboard that you create? Yeah, I, I love how you're asking that. So there is a framework and the framework is, is human centered and it's about their demands. So we always do a gap analysis or a needs analysis and then we want to reverse engineer from their demands, what would they need? So if they're a runner, we know running a single leg. Uh, we know when you land, it's five to eight times body weight. Uh, we, we know that you require some lateral pelvic stability to land uh, with, with uh, you know, good, good efficiency. Uh, we know you need a certain amount of mobility in your gray toe at the first MTP joint. These things are easy to explain to people that the ankle bone is connected to the knee bone. So if it's a back pain patient, it's so easy to explain why the hip is important. If it's a knee, it's so easy to explain why the, the foot and ankle and, and the hip and trunk are important. Uh, if it's a shoulder or neck, it's very easy to explain why the torso is important. So, so without going into just a mechanical thing, what we want to do is we want to find things we can change. It's about empowerment. So it's not about biomechanics. It's about biobehavioral. So these are things that light up on the measurements. 
they matter. We can tell a story. We can connect dots. But that's not the end. That's the beginning. So if I put on my Stuart McGill hat, you know, that's one thing. But if I put on my Peter O'Sullivan hat, that's a different thing. I'm always thinking about behavior and and empowerment and motivation and confidence. Always, always, always. And I never want them to bog down on mechanics. So mechanics is part of it. Just like their imaging is part of it. You say people come in, they want to adjust it. What about people come in? I've had a scan. My scan says I've got an L4-5. You know, I, I have to validate their beliefs and then broaden their beliefs. I might might be a little bit funny here, but I can just imagine you putting on actually a Stuart McGill hat and a Peter O'Sullivan hat. I reckon we should actually create those. They probably sell pretty well around the world. Um, some very it should unique, be one hat uh, and it should be half and <laughs> half and half. It should be Peter's hair and Stu's mustache. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, think, I don't think anyone else can pull the mustache off as well as Stu, as we chatted about on the podcast uh, not too long ago with him. Um, now you've. We've dropped a lot of names and a lot of those hats, and obviously you've taken a lot of your approach from lots of different people. Well, who who are some of those biggest people, I guess, um, that have influenced your career, and what have you taken from them? Well, I think we're in an era where, uh, especially for physios, and 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 I think uh, you know, chiros need to need to be more like physios. Like I, I, I hope at some point in the future, there's recognition for chiros like there is for physios. Um, uh, I think what we're realizing now is we need to bridge the gap from strength and conditioning from S and C to physio. And, and Philip Glasgow is a person who's a great mentor to me. Um, I never met him, but he said rehab is training in the presence of injury. He was the, the PT who led Great Britain's uh, Olympic team to the Rio Olympics. Uh, he talks about the gap analysis, like your own in Australia, Jill Cook or Rio Boney. Um, I don't know if I said her name right, but but Rio is just a giant in my mind. I I, I can't listen to her or study from her enough. Uh, the way she talks about evidence and how important evidence is, but but really in practice, you know, the evidence isn't going to apply n equals one. So you learn like what you're saying, a framework, but then you have to find out what's your What's the person in front of you, the human in per front of you? What are their demands? What are their beliefs? What is their understanding? What is their expectation? And whatever their lived experience is, whatever, whatever they've embodied, uh, that is the beginning point. If somebody believes they should not do a certain thing, like I think I should stay neutral and I shouldn't bend forward, um, you know, we, we, we honor that. And then we clandestinely put them in a position where they bend and they have no trouble. And we, we point it out to them and they go, oh, you're right. Should I do that more? And then we can explain adaptation that you've lost your adaptation. So for me, the S&C gives us this, this vision to adaptation. It's not enough to talk about pain science. In fact, I don't talk about pain science at all unless I'm talking about an amputee and phantom pain. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is we want to give people a positive experience we want to explain that that in the beginning you know things are ringing bells there's a lot of amplification because there's concern about tissue threat and what we want to do is we want to respect that and realize that not every hurt equals harm so i'll use a traffic light metaphor and and remind people when they were a kid like you skin your knee you don't want your mom keeping you in like you know it it's not damaging. You're not going to get infected. I want to play. And, and, and so, you know, this idea about hurt and harm, it's, it's a big hinge for us. And it helps us to get into the adaptation realm where there's good pain. Like I want you to feel some doms in your glutes and your quads and your abs and your lats and your abs without spiking your low back pain. But at first you might be so attuned to the low back channel that's in the front of your windshield that it may take some time before we put it in the rear view mirror. And, and so, you know, this is the whole S and C model. And I think there, there's a lot of talk now about how uh, we sh we shouldn't talk about bridging the gap between S and C and physical therapy anymore. The gap has already been built. It's time to cross it. <laughs> yeah, I think and I don't think we cross it with corrective exercises and managing people away from load, like Tim Gabbett says. We want to prepare people because at the end of the day, it's not the load that breaks you down, like Tim says. It's the load you're not prepared for. So really, it's not about bio and pain science. It's not about Stu and Peter. 
it, it's really about overprotection, which is the Peter realm. And people are overprotective and it's normal for them to be overprotective given all the nocebos that every Cairo and physio and MD is, is, is spewing out. Uh, and it's about under preparation. So it's about under preparation from sports science and no greater sports scientist than Tim Gabbett. And it's about overprotection from pain science. It, I used to think it was about marrying pain science and biomechanics. No, it's about marrying pain science and sports science. And I just love this world. It's making me younger and younger because there's so much to learn. It never stops, that's for sure. Is there any um, time where you go the opposite way, though, where someone has maybe got, um, well, I won't say too much confidence, but they're maybe not adequately prepared for the thing that they want to be able to do? Um, how do you go about yes. dealing with, with that other end of the spectrum? You see all the nuances, right? So there's the type A's that go boom and bust. And in Rehab of the Spine, even way back in the second edition, which I hope anybody who has it will burn it, um, uh, we talked about there are people who ignore stop rules because they go boom and bust. And they need pacing. They need graded exposures, okay? And then you have people that are afraid, so they're avoidant. And those people need a, a large dose of Peter O'Sullivan. So, so um, uh, the avoiders need reassurance and they need empowerment. Uh, and they need to learn, you know, of course, through experience that not every hurt equals harm, but there's other people who go boom and bust and they really need to learn that you have to train for the game and you need to slow cook that the graded exposures don't do too much too soon. So you have some people that are doing too little, too late, and they're afraid. And you have some people doing too much too soon and they, they need to be a little more afraid, <laughs> but I, I have patients, you know, one person, uh, comes to mind, he, he is really fit and he plays tennis five days a week and he runs 30 miles a week and he's driven by family history of heart disease. So he's all go, go, go. But he has, his back goes out horrifically and he doesn't, he never got the message that you have to train for the game. You need to train for running and tennis. You need some S and C. <laughs> so you don't have to be a pro athlete. And that's what Exos taught is from pros to average Joes. Whether you're a sedentary secretary or your NFL lineman, we look at the squat the same way. You know, and that brings us to the really our my favorite coach practically, uh, Lax, Lachlan Wilmot. So, 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 so Lax has taught me so much about the goal is in the off season to load, load up the pro and, and in season to still figure out little sweet spots on the calendar where a, a person isn't playing back to back games or they're not on the road where you can slide in these, these high intensity sessions. Um, maybe we don't need the same volume, but we need the intensity to top the battery off to send a stimulus to the brain that, Hey, we're not wearing down as the season goes on. We're maintaining. So these are all things that I'm learning. Yeah. And so obviously there's been a lot of your, a lot of change in your practice over the last sort of 30 you know, to 40 years. What, what are some of the biggest I'm changes? I'm not that old. No, 30, 30 years. You said early 80s, so we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> but what are some of the biggest um, changes that um, you see going forward that we're going to have to make as a profession? Get up to date, for goodness sakes. We're going to have to realize that there's a tyranny of the mainstream, like David Bowie said, and um, we don't want to follow trends and hypes. Pavel Satsaline talks about this. It's not about what's trendy. It's not about what's shiny. It's not about what's on Instagram. Um, people need to migrate over to Twitter and listen to Stomaticus and physical acti activity. We're in a world where there's a physical inactivity crisis, and it's tied to a syndemic of childhood obesity and global warming. And we can be agents of change. We can use our, our, our positioning as healthcare professionals to become positive health coaches, to talk about the gift of injury and explain that, that we want to get upstream of the problem. And it's not just about your hip is out or, or you need to activate your TA or do the big three. It, it's, really a, a, it's really about movement snacks. It's about sitting less. It's about starting with, starting with 10 minutes of walking. Um, and eventually building people up to meet the PA guidelines. So, so I think that, that when we realize that physical inactivity is killing as many people as smoking. Now, how is that possible? Smoking is more deadly. It's possible because there are fewer people that smoke and there are more people that are sedentary. <laughs> and when you do the math, uh, we see that they're equally deadly. And which is easier to change? Something that's a habit or something that's addictive? 
The habit is easier to change. Now think about all of our contacts, every person that has a musculoskeletal pain, that is 90% of physical therapy practice. Some physical therapists see people with strokes and other things. I'm a chiropractor that it's all, it's almost always musculoskeletal pain. You're an osteopath too. So, so each of these is an opportunity to help people get upstream and how many people are overweight? How many people are sedentary? The majority of the people we're seeing. <laughs> so all these people can get the memo that they can start to walk more. They can add a little bit of resistance training into the, into the, the, the mix. Um, and that's going to help prevent heart disease. They're going to live longer regardless, but are they going to live well? No. <laughs> we're older, younger. Yeah. Lifespan could only outrun health span for so long. And, 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 and the bill is coming due. So we want to make some deposits. What is true wealth? True wealth is, is where you're um, uh, saving more than you're spending. So people with musculoskeletal pain who are not prepared for the task, like Tim Gabbett would say, are, are spending more than they're saving. When you get a musculoskeletal pain, it's a signal that, hey, there's interest coming due and it's about to compound. So if we can leverage that to get away from adjustments and massage, I'm not saying never do them, but they're catalysts at best. And at worst, they're fool's gold that creates dependency. Let's empower self-management by giving people positive experience with movement and showing them simple things they can do for themselves. And I love where you started there when you talk about the influence you can have, not only obviously in your patients, but on the wider community as well. You've probably done that better in the health profession than almost anyone, I think, through, I guess, your, your research, um, your education, your courses, and obviously your textbooks. Where did that passion come from? And how would you recommend someone go about it if you know they're trying to start to build that? Obviously, apart from spending you know, 90, 100 hours a week um, work, working tirelessly. But how, I love yeah, what how I do. do. I love what I do, but I also I also love walking my dog. I love hiking. I love playing tennis. I don't play it enough. I love playing golf, even though it's it's miserable. <laughs> I'm a terrible golfer. It's so painful. But um, you know, I love you know watching Netflix with my wife. You know, I love having a tequila. I love going out with friends. I love eating good food. So so you know, I'm not really working that many hours, but I'm very focused when I work. Uh, I, um, I think the passion, I look I, I, nobody's asked me this question about passion, you know, let's talk about mastery. Uh, if you want to be a benchmark, if you want to make a difference, if you don't want to just be part of the herd, there's a simple process, the process of, of mastery is one that takes um, consistency. It takes having a, a vision, finding what you, you aspire for. And if you aspire to be better tomorrow than you are today, then it's easy to put in the work. Like if I want to lose weight, then it's like, okay, I'm going to get on the Peloton or I'm going to go lift some kettlebells. Uh, it's not an end in itself. So mastery is, is about grit, but it's more, if you listen to Angela Duckworth, the author of Grit, uh, it's more about passion than about grit. Her book is called Grit, but her book is about mastery. So it's confusing. But what is mastery? When you really nail Angela Duckworth to the wall, mastery is about passion. So, so where's my passion come from? I am a rebel. You asked, the first thing you asked me was about, well, go back when, why'd you start Cairo? I'm a rebel, okay? I, I, you know, David Bowie, I'll double down. Uh, uh, we have to decide, do we want to see the world change? I'm not happy with the world. I'm not happy with the world. There's a tyranny of the mainstream. And we see it in our professions. We see it in, in the vested interest of all of the, the proprietary groups that have something to sell. My group, First Principles of Movement, is agnostic, okay? I want people to, to get Strong First certified or RKC. I don't care. I want people to take BackFit Pro, to do cognitive functional training with Peter O'Sullivan. I want them to learn MDT from the McKenzie people. I want them to take DNS and learn about the ontogenesis uh, cascade over a 9 to 14-month period. I want them to learn about postural restoration as to FMS, SFMA, learn it all. You know, we now know you should be a generalist if you're young. You should not specialize early. 
you should look out from the rabbit hole rather than go down the rabbit hole. Otherwise, it's like Alice in Wonderland and you drink the Kool-Aid. So, so develop a broad base of expertise and then you'll find your population, whether you're working more with seniors and balance is important and sarcopenia, uh, whether you're working more with youth and skill acquisition and gamification is important. You're working with, with top level athletes and recovery is more important because they've earned recovery. So, so you'll then be passionate about recovery or you'll be passionate about balance and sarcopenia and muscle mass. So you'll be passionate about skill act, uh, be a generalist, find your population. And, and I think it's natural. Uh, the worst thing is if you just do what you learned in school. <laughs> I think that's pretty dangerous for, for everyone. I think most professions, but especially in the health profession where it is changing, you know, so much and evolving, um, probably quicker now than ever. And probably thanks to some of the technology, like, you know, the, the, um, you've mentioned a few times the platform like Twitter. Like it's never been easier to get access to sort of research in some of the greatest minds in the world. Um, so obviously that's a big influence on your day to day. What are some other sort of technology or apps that you like to utilize, uh, either to stay up to date or to enhance your practice? I don't think, good question. I don't think there are, there are apps that I double down on. Uh, I give myself time. My morning paper is Twitter. And so I have people I follow, you know, like JP Caniero, like Jill Cook, like Peter O'Sullivan, like Stomaticus from, from Australia. And Lax, Lax is uh, on Twitter, more on Instagram. Um, uh, you have the guys like Alex Natera doing the ISO work. Uh, the ISO work is spectacular, and he's got a, a partner, uh, uh, Daniel, Danny Lamb, I think his name is, I might have butchered it, who's in Singapore, uh, I think Singapore, maybe Malaysia. Uh, there's, there's people all over the world. There, there's uh, John Kiley, who uh, is very active and on the area of mindset. He says mindset's more important than tactics that the idea that for every stimulus there's a response is a dogma. He calls it a zombie belief in training. He goes, mindset is more important than this idea about specificity. Um, uh, you know, we got the Franz Bosch community. They're, they're posting. Um, they're, they have the whole evidence-based field. So Chris Mayer in, in, in Sydney, um, uh, Rachel Buckbinder, uh, my friend Jan Hartvinkensen uh, in Denmark. Uh, oh my gosh, the dilemma is the dilemma of, of, of the avalanche of so much information at the speed of light. So that's where you need filters. And I tell all my mentees, we have a mentorship. We've had 150 people from nearly 20 countries and 10 professions that have done this over the pandemic. Um, I tell all the mentees to uh, just follow me on Twitter and then see who, who speaks to you. You know, it's not that many people. And I try to keep it apolitical. Um, and, and it doesn't take long to, to sift through the feed. Um, Instagram, of course, being visual is, is, is a dead end pathway too often. Um, you have to be really uh, careful about uh, your time management on something like, like that. So as far as apps, Instagram is, is, is not so good. I mean, Tic Tac would be, Tic Tac, Tic Tac would be horrible, you know, because it's built, it's built to be very viral. You know, like going to casino and all the sounds that that, that dopamine type things. So um, I think Twitter is important to uh, filter. Uh, you don't want to filter too much. You want to be broad. But um, uh, if you're not exposed, then all you have is the last seminar you took and what you learned in school. And and the regarding school, you know that's a weird weird one, Stephen. Because yes, we have to go beyond school, but then you get you get really good people who are skeptics, who go, who love to attack school. School's job was not, not to teach you how to be a healthcare professional. School's job was to make it so you're not dangerous to put the public. So you don't malpractice. It wasn't teaching you how to be the best DO, DC, PT. School was not for that. So if you're criticizing it, that's a straw man argument. And there's so many people that love to criticize. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. It feels so good to criticize. You're right. You're right. They're wrong. You're right. People want to feel right. You're right. But the reality is, it's not about criticizing school. It's about, okay, now what should I do? What should I do? 
There are seminars. They all have vested interests. What the F am I supposed to do? Who do I trust? So I think that's where evidence comes in. Evidence also doesn't tell you what to do. Just listen to Rio Aboni. I'll send you a 90 second video where she says that. Um, but I start with evidence. We should be evidence based. Evidence informed. Know the evidence. Think like a scientist and act like a coach. It's it's plan B stuff. Tyson said plan A goes out the window as soon as you punched in the nose. Every patient punches me in the nose. <laughs> I give them my cell phone. I go, tell me if you have questions. Tell me when you flare. I'm not happy till you flare. We got to change the program. It's not a cookie cutter. And so it's going to change. So and no matter how often I tell them that it's in one ear out the other, they think what I gave them is, is it. And then I don't see them again. And a month later, they go, oh, my God, I love the program, that program you gave me. And I'm like, no, you're still doing it. Or they go, it didn't work. That's why I didn't come back. I'm like, what are you going to do? <laughs> No, it's a little bit too close to home. I think everyone listening uh, can relate to those same experiences just there. Now, speaking about seminars, uh, obviously Lockie um, is bringing you out. You've got some seminars coming down under here uh, later in the year. What do people expect when they come to your seminars? What are they going to learn? Well, a couple things. We're going to go over a framework. We're going to go over a gap analysis. We're going to do a lot of measurement. So there's three steps. We're going to go over... Uh, the Peter O'Sullivan step, which is listening to a person's story to, to receive their story. So we want to determine what matters. And that comes from the person. Um, uh, number two, we're going to measure that stuff. That's that's your world, Steve. You know, we, we can't manage. We can't measure. And so we're going to measure what matters in our gap analysis related, reverse engineered to their goals after we've determined what matters. And then we're going to come up with a plan to make it meaningful, to connect the dots in a simple way. Uh, so that we can, I don't want to say change what matters, which is what Matt Jordan says in Calgary, uh, but, um, but to, to, to create a plan to change what matters because these things take time. And I don't want to give people false hope like, like um, Christian Thorberg from Denmark who, who did the research on the Copenhagen adductor. He says the sooner a person realizes that their groin tendinopathy isn't going away in six weeks. The, the more they won't feel bad and chase hype like stem cells and PRP and apply that to Achilles tendinopathy, ACL rehab. What's worse for ACL post-op rehab than chasing getting back to sport in seven months? Explain to people that it's going to take over a year and we've got measurements and not just hopping measurements. I want to see you do a, a, a 30 foot sprint and stop on a dime on one leg. Can you do it? No, you can't. Let's work on that thing. Let's look at your single leg squat like uh, Hughes talks about. Hands behind your back, single leg squat. Can you do 18 of these puppies? I don't know anybody who can do 18 of those. Okay, we set a high bar. Let's start to work towards it. It's like a dojo. Nobody goes into dojo and expects to be a black belt, let, let alone an orange belt, in six weeks. Nobody's expecting to be a yellow belt in six weeks. Why is it in the in our Cairo osteopathy and physical therapy or physiotherapy schools, people are thinking that there's six week protocols. I'll tell you why it's because of the reimbursement system. So that's driven by the structure. It's a social thing. It's a social political thing. Well, since when does the, the reimbursement system tell us how to offer human centered programming? Human-centered program is about the person and not about the reimbursement. And if you know self-management and you determine what matters and you measure it, you have criteria-based rehab. Okay, why, do I, why am I passionate? I'm pa passionate because of the tyranny of the mainstream. It's all left it. up. So don't get locked into what you taught in school about protocols. There are no protocols. There's, there's as Stephen says, a framework. We use a gap analysis. We determine what matters. Gabbett has that at one end of his spectrum, that that's the goals, the demands. And then we measure what matters. That's, that's what you got now. Do you have what you need? Probably not. Rehab is bridging the gap from one to the other. Simple. <laughs> it is simple. So I'm passionate because I don't understand why this is hard. It's hard because it's complex. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's simple, but it's not easy. Why? Because of status quo, cognitive dissonance, and vested interests. 
So first principles, what can they expect? They're going to expect to learn how to, to take a person uh, to, 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 to figure out what matters, determine what matters, to receive a history. I almost said take a history. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in there. Um, and, and then we measure. So we run through a dashboard and we determine what measures and we're going to see where we can make the greatest impact with, with the minimal dose. Um, and that's what the, the whole 12 hours is about. It used to be three 18 hour courses. We, thanks to the pandemic, offered a 25 hour high value webinar that you can watch for free to prepare for the, the program. Laura Mosley was my guest, uh, Matt Lowe, Peter Stilwell, Rachel Balkovec, Nick Winkleman. They were all my guests. We talked about Batman versus Alfred and how to guide by the side, how to reconceptualize uh, and uh, you know, hit the ground running, get that under your belt. Uh, it's all free, 25 hours, high value series. Uh, look, look for it at FPM's website. Uh, and when you come in, we're going to have fun. I'm not going to talk for more than 10 to 15 minutes without us moving. And we're going to move through a dashboard assessment of how your feet meet, meet the ground. Number one, these are our fundamentals. Uh, number two, uh, what, how you assess somebody's heart rate and talk test, whether their diaphragm is working with their pillar, whether they, lay, they lack the fitness to do a beast crawl or a high plank to low plank, and they're huffing and puffing right off the bat and they can't go three, two, one, they go three, two, one. Number three, their mobility of key areas like T-spine, shoulder, uh, hips, ankle, big toe. Number four, pillar prep, glutes and abs, uh, pillar, you solid in there uh, without holding your breath. Uh, you're able to create stiffness on, on demand and be relaxed, like Peter O'Sullivan says. Most people who don't have back pain, they're relaxed. This idea about stiffness is way overdone. There's a time and a place for it, maybe under heavy load, but usually you get it for free. My patients who have back surgeries, they go free abs. I don't say tighten your core. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, finally, energy storage and release. None of this matters if you don't have good storage and release. And so you have to be able to absorb energy and release it. Even if you're 75 years old going downstairs, if you can't land, if you can't land, you're at risk of, of, of a fall. And a fall is the number one killer of people in their 70s. And we have more people living longer than ever before in history. Uh, so we're going to go through these fundamentals. Uh, in the end, this assessment of what matters becomes a, a framework for determining what's too painful what's too dysfunctional and what's just right. It's Goldilocks. Whatever's just right, we, we recommend it. It didn't threaten them. It wasn't too painful. We're reassuring them that, yeah, you're doing it well. Not policing perfection because they always want to know, well, I don't want to do it wrong. I don't want to do it wrong. So we give them the stuff that we can say, yeah, you did that well. And then we tell them to do it like a movement snack. Usually it's four to six minutes of stuff. We know in terms of physiology uh, from, uh, uh, Andrew Barr's work, B-A-H-R, that ligaments and tendons um, uh, can adapt new collagen networks uh, as a response to load every four to six hours. So he recommended for Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson and recommends for all of us that we give a small dosage of training that's about a seven, eight on RPE about not emptying their tank, okay? Uh, we, we create a stimulus that uh, leaves some reserve. Uh, short dose, five, six minutes of stuff, three times a day, and support it with nutritional supplementation. Um, and that way you're, you're accelerating recovery by 300% because you can adapt every five to six hours. So if you're only doing once a day, or worse, only when they come visit you in your, your gym, what a lost opportunity. And we supplement that with every day hitting the PA guidelines from, from the World Health Organization. You know, let's get out and walk. Raise your heart rate. Walk. Create a base for zone two polarized training. So you build mitochondria, you build recovery ability and potential. So when we give you that stress stimulus that, that, that the tendinopathy experts are talking about, like Jill Cook, that your body can, can assimilate it and, and can have a positive response. Sorry, I got, I got passionate again. I think there's some fantastic tips in there. So if people are looking to find out more about your courses when the nearest dates are near them or how to join your um, online mentorship, how do they go about it? Uh, Firstprinciplesofmovement.com. Fantastic. All right. Or the thing I like uh, to... message me on Instagram or Twitter. 
and yeah. I'll, I'll send you a link. Uh, the the early bird expired for Sydney, but I think the webmaster didn't take it down yet. I think Melbourne's is like the 22nd, which is in a couple of days, and uh, uh, Sydney's expired, but I think it's still there. <laughs> and there's also mm -hmm. payment plans. Uh, we have a mentorship starting up in a month. It's the seventh cohort. Uh, you can apply for that, uh, but do the high value series. Instagram, message me any questions you have. We have a Facebook page. You can Instagram the community. Um, follow Lacklin. Follow Lackey. <laughs> yeah. He's my favorite source for, for smart, intelligent, yet, yet uncomplicated programming. Uh, you know, too hard or too easy or two to the side. Uh, him and Jordy are, are, are godsends. Follow Alex and Tara. Um, you know, you, you're going to, the more you, you have a background before I come, if, if you're in Australia listening to this in December with Ryan Chow, um, uh, the more exciting the, uh, the course is, the less you have to reconceptualize. If you are starting to get the whole Tim Gabbett, Peter O'Sullivan thing, the whole biomechanics, pain science thing, uh, if you're familiar with some of these people that I'm mentioning, it's like 10 people. <laughs> How hard is that? You know, how hard is that? 10 people I mentioned. Uh, uh, I, reckon, I reckon I'm going to go through after this and, uh, and tag, tag everyone, Craig. I think there might be a few more than 10 that have stuck in there through the course of the last hour or so. But we'll... Uh, we'll, we'll, well, some of them uh, have leave. passed away like Levin and Yanda. <laughs> Uh, yeah, may, may not uh, be able to but tag But the course is fun. Get... We do a lot of gamification. We do a lot of partner exercise. We run through how to make a dashboard. We go through how this is about fundamentals. So it applies to everybody. You know, there's a famous saying from Mike Boyle that 80% of, that, that 80 of our, 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 our training for people of different sports and activities is the same. Only 20% is sports specific. So there's this idea like I want to make it precise to my tennis guy, my sprinter, my swimmer. Well, everybody needs to learn to squat, lunge, hinge, push, pull, carry. Everybody needs, you know, some uh, uh, work capacity, some mitochondrial density so they can recover from any adaptive stimuli. Uh, so these are universal things. Everybody needs to have good feet, even if you're a swimmer. <laughs> everybody needs... Uh, to be able to pass the talk test so I know their diaphragm is working. You know, you could take, you could spend thousands of dollars at a Wim Hof seminar to learn about breathing. You, you could take 15 PRI and DNS courses and, and they great courses, amazing courses. Uh, but I can teach you the most important thing and it's not a secret. I'm not going to say there's take my course learn the secret about breathing. You know, I can tell it to you right now in 20 seconds. Do the talk test. There's nothing more powerful for making sure that a person is using their diaphragm in an efficient, wise way. Can you pass the talk test? What is the talk test? Talk test is, can you speak in a DJ voice and say three, two, one, when you're in a high plank, when you're doing a lift, when you're throwing a med ball, when you're doing stiletto walk, when you're sprinting, when you, can you pass it? Can you pass the talk test? It's as simple as that. That's a great little takeaway. I always like to finish the podcast on this note. I'd love to know your top three take-home points uh, to help physios, chiros, osteos, movement professionals around the world bring their practice into the 21st century. Okay. And I love that you finished with movement professionals because we talked about S&C legends and we keep talking about the uh, physio, osteo, and chiro professions. But really the personal trainers who aren't hired by a team and are working for a client are to me the ambassadors of the movement as medicine or exercise as medicine uh, 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 approach. And the strength and conditioning or SNC coach is very important too because they're really leaders for us. Uh, but I don't ever want to sideline the SNC coach and the personal fitness trainer. When we're talking about positive health coaching, we're talking about medicine, how it's fallen into negative health messaging and over diagnosis and and fear mongering about labeling people with you have this and you have that. Um, I feel like that, that, that one of the things, the first message is to learn from the personal trainers. Uh, really the take home message is you got to give people a positive experience with movement or they ain't coming back. So it's not about what, you know, it's not about your system. Uh, it's not about your methods. Uh, the methods as Dr. Levitt said should serve the goals and whose goals, the client's goals. So I think number one take home is give a positive experience with, movement. Number two is also about personal trainers. If you do number one, you're creating value. 
one of the things that Ryan Chow talks about all the time is we need to get away from it being transactional, which drives us into, we have so many visits and there's this protocol. No, it's about the person and we don't know where it's going to take us. So, so we debrief a lot. And I think, um, being in constant communication with your patients or clients is crucial. So we open the door with my second take home, which is communicate better, use debriefs, let, let people know that it's concierge and, and you want to hear from them. It's your culture. It's our commitment. Uh, our community is about, is about creating a person centered, human centered approach. And that means we're here for you. We don't have all the answers, but we're going to get there together. Okay. And so the, Take home number two is communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, uh, so, so human centered and, 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 and it's, it's not about transactions, it's about value and the biggest value is communication. And, and really number three, I think take home is the big community of all of us that if we can all realize that we're in this world with this inactivity crisis, that's part of the syndemic of global warming and childhood obesity. And we realize that, that we have hundreds of thousands of contacts we're gonna make with other human beings. And each one of those contacts is an opportunity to get upstream of their musculoskeletal pain. Or if you're a trainer, upstream of their goal for weight loss or bigger arms, uh, to talk about sustainable athleticism and healthy longevity and how we want them to be empowered to do simple things well. Like Mark Versegan at EXO says, simple things savagely well. So that's really what, what Peter O'Sullivan and Tim Gabbett and Blackie are all about, is simple things done savagely well. And that's really our commitment. That's our culture. And as a community, if we want to make a difference in the bigger issues, not just musculoskeletal pain, but global warming, not just pain, but disability in an aging population, I think we can use the gift of injury to get beyond the fix it approach and the quick fix and the cookie cutter to empowering people about self-management and how it's going to have all of these ripple effects towards less cognitive decline, less risk of falls, less risk of frailty, less risk of risk of being disabled after the age of 50 or 55 by your hip or musk or low back niggle, as you say in Australia. So human centered, communication and and big picture about the global inactivity crisis and how, how that, that that's tied to, to to issues that are far bigger than our one-on-one -on -one contacts each of us can be and why am i excited why wouldn't i be excited every patient you see every client you see is an opportunity to make an impact I think that is the perfect place to leave it there, Craig. Uh, that got, moving beyond the profession, looking at the big picture, thinking about your influence, you know, not only on your community but also, um, you know, the world around you. So, thank you very much for joining us, Craig. Looking forward to seeing you down under later in the year. Uh, if you're looking to find more about Craig, you can head to the uh, podcast um, bio, or you can head to firstprinciplesofmovement.com. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you, man. I'll see you soon, mate. Peace out.